Let's talk about the intermediate value theorem. This is one of the big applications of the idea of continuity. Um, it's really super fundamental for the theory of calculus, and we're not we're not going to go into it very deeply. But it's worth mentioning partly because it's really a very simple idea, even if um, going into the details can be a little hairy. And I want to pose a problem first before I get into the, the, the simple idea, really, that's behind the intermediate value theorem. Uh, it's uh, one way to think about one way one where it's useful is solving equations or, or thinking about equations anyway. And I want to think about this equation. I want to think about natural log of x is equal to x times e to the minus x. How would we go about trying to find a solution to that, an x so that that makes those two sides equal? Well the most important thing to start with is you can't use algebra to do this. When you have an x that's outside an e and inside an e like this, unless it's a very specific kind of special form, you can't use any kind of algebra to solve that. You can prove that, that, it, that algebra is in fact useless for this, um, this problem. Um, so that's a little dismaying. Well, what about using the calculator. That's kind of a, a thing that people go to as a default. Um, and in fact, that's sort of what we're going to do is we're going to justify why using the calculator actually makes sense here. And it's something you might not have thought about doubting. But what I want to do is I want to imagine I have a fairly rudimentary calculator. And really, our calculators are just like what I'm going to describe here. They just do more, but it's not qualitatively different. And what the calculator does, what our calculator does, is it's going to be able to plot just a few points here. Now, I'm going to graph, in order to figure out if two things are equal, one way to do that is to graph this one, let's call that f of x, and this one, let's call it g of x, graph them and see where they intersect. Well, ln of 1 is 0, and ln of 2 turns out to be about 0.7. And so let's say that's right about here. So let's say that's 1 on the vertical scale. And ln of 3 is a little bit more than 1. Let's suppose that's it. It looks like a straight line. It's not really, but that's OK. It's going gonna, it's gonna to curve. It really kind of is curving in a nice arc here. So actually, let's just move that up a little bit. Let's fudge it a little bit. OK, fudge that down maybe. Uh, I love uh, non-erasable markers. So what's really going on is that ln has a nice smooth curve. But suppose we only have these three data points for ln from our rudimentary calculations. x e to the minus x is another kind of interesting looking curve. It, um, it goes roughly like this. It starts out negative because the x is negative. It goes up and then it comes down. It's the kind of thing you can check on your calculator if you want. And when x is 1, it's 1 over e. It's something like in here. And then it's 2 over e squared, something like this. Suppose these four points were the only points I knew for that function. Let's think about that. Actually, ooh, let's use some colors. Um, I'm going to have to like circle them in red. So these are the x, e, the x ones. Now can we conclude that there is a place where those graphs cross? Well, just from this data, it's kind of hard to tell that. But let's think about what happens if we sketch in, if we trust that we can sketch in between those dots a curve. If this curve looks something like this, and the LNX graph looks something like this, then indeed, they must cross. And that's really cool. Just from plotting a very small number of points and just this discrete data, we've concluded that they must cross in the middle. But what did we use to conclude that they must cross? It's that they can't kind of hop over each other somehow. What if, and I don't think this is going to be remotely plausible to you, and it, sh it shouldn't for good reasons, but what if the picture was more like, here's the ln points that we have. Here's the e points that we have. What if it was like this? This guy maybe increased, and then suddenly, and then maybe went uh, went uh, increased for a while, and then suddenly jumps down here. 
What if that function was not continuous? It could, in fact, leap over this guy and not have an intersection. There might, we might be misleading ourselves in thinking that there is a place where these guys are equal. Well, it's exactly, the difference between these two pictures is exactly that here the red curve is continuous and here it's not continuous. And so a big use of the intermediate value theorem is to be able to extrapolate from the situation where you just have some discrete data and trust that yes, there is a missing point in there where they intersect. Now again, as I said, your calculator, this is exactly what your calculator does. It just plots more pixels, but it doesn't plot every infinitely many pixel in here. And when you get it to do the intersection of two graphs, when you get it to plot two graphs, like y1 equals this, y2 equals this, and you do second calc intersect, it gets an approximate value that it thinks is pretty close to this point. But it never, ever can actually nail down this point. It's a weird, weird irrational number that it is not even trying to, to, uh, to find. It's just saying, I believe there is one to be found, and here's something that's really close to it. And that's basically what we've done here. And the reason there is one to be found is that these functions are continuous and they must cross each other. So that's actually a lot of how this gets used. But let's look at um, the basic situation. The basic situation is a little simpler. Instead of having two functions, it's a little simpler to just have one and have the thing that it's crossing be a horizontal line. So the mathematical version of this is that if I have a function, this is the graph of y equals f of x, and f is continuous, and I have any predetermined height here that I want to cross, let's say, I um, hmm, can't remember what the book uses. What does the book use there? I want to use the same language they use. Um, n that I must cross that. Well, now, I, I must. I, there's no need to cross it if I always am above it or always am below it. So how do I make sure I, I, I am not in that situation? I say I'm, x is going from a to b. And as long as f of a, that height, and f of b bracket n, as long as I start out below and end up above, I must cross. Similarly, if I started out above and ended up below, I would have to cross as well. It's a very sort of geometrically obvious fact about a function. Remember, one of the ways to think about continuous function is it's the kind of thing you can graph without your pen leaving paper. And if you have to go from here below n and up to here as your destination above n and you can't, your graph can't leave the paper, it's pretty obvious that you're going to have to cross this. Again, there's some real subtleties if you really think about the depths of it, but that's, it's, it's pretty intuitive. And I like the way I like to describe it is imagine this is time and this is position. Then this is one of our familiar graphs of position as a function of time. And let's say this is along position along Interstate 25 and north is going this way. And suppose I start in Albuquerque and I up at, end up in Santa Fe. And I try to claim that I never, ever went by, let's say, hmm, what's in between? Casino Hollywood, say. If I claim I got from from Albuquerque, and I the, here I'm on I-25. I don't go around the back way or something behind the mountains. I start out in Albuquerque, and I'm on I-25, and I go north to Santa Fe. At some point, I must have passed by Casino Hollywood, because that's a place in on the way. If I, I really have to stay on I-25, how could I possibly even think of not having that be true? Well, this is the kind of graph, I have to end in about 20 seconds here, but this is the kind of graph where that might not be true. I start out here, boom, woo! And I'll let you think about the fact that that would be a teleporting car. That's a discontinuous function, and that's not physically reasonable because cars don't teleport.